Emma Wong for as excellent examples of the kind of work that uh, professor do. And I thought the place would be full of students, and I can say that. <laughs> but uh, it's a bad time of the year. People are trying to get their grades in and to get off to their summer um, destinations and so on. So, but uh, I'm sure there'll be people coming in um, you know, during the lecture. So I'll just uh, begin by introducing each of them and, and uh, doing a very short introduction so that, so that you can have as much time as possible to hear them. Um, Margaret is a professor of linguistics here at the State University. She received her undergraduate degree in English from Carleton College and a PhD in linguistics from the University of Chicago. And she joined us here in 1987. One of the f things I either have in my accent to put in my obituary is that I helped to hire uh, Marta Rocky. Do you remember that? Oh, she did. <laughs> she did. Um, her primary research has been on the description and history of Hmong and languages in the Hmong mean family. She's also studied language contact and, cha and change in Asia and to languages worldwide. Her book, uh, Hmong Mean uh, Language History, was published in 2010 by Pacific Linguistics. It contains a new reconstruction of Koto Man. Uh, and those who are linguists know how difficult that is to go back and to reconstruct a language uh, as it might have been spoken by the original speakers. Very difficult work. Um, she's also the author of Meaningful Tone, published in by Northern, Northern Illinois University Press. And with Paul Newman, she edited Linguistics Fieldwork, published in 2001 by Cambridge University Press. And in 1991, she founded the Southeast Asian Linguistic Society with an international conference here at Wayne State University. I remember attending that conference. It is now the primary international gathering for linguists studying these languages. And, and that uh, conference has been held in various parts of the world, including Thailand, Vietnam, Indonesia, Malaysia, and at universities across the United States, Australia, and Europe. And as a indication of how well she is received in her discipline, she was invited to teach a course on historical linguistics at the Linguistic Society of America Summer Institute at the University of Chicago this year. Liliana Provagak is a professor of linguistics and director of the linguistics program at Wayne State University here. She received her undergraduate degree in English from the University of Marcel in Serbia and her PhD in linguistics from the University of Southern California. She joined us here in 1991. It might have had something to do with Liliana's hiring. <laughs> <laughs> she has taught linguistics also at the University of Novosad in Serbia, at Liliana University of Bloomington, and the University of uh, Venice in Italy, that I didn't know. Uh, her research interests include syntax, Slavic syntax, and the evolution of syntax. She has published three books on syntax. The first one was published in 1994 by Cambridge University Press, entitled Negative and Positive Polarity. Um, or the second book was uh, entitled A Syntax of Serbia, published in 2005. And then she co edited a book entitled The Syntax of Non Sententials, published by Benjamin in 2006. Um, on the topic of evolution, Professor Kovogak has published 16 papers. Uh, including three in the Journal of Biolinguistics. She 
she has delivered nine invited keynote presentations and will teach a course at the LSA Summer Institute in July, another indication of how uh, internationally well received she is and what an expert she is in the area of language evolution. Her book on the topic evolutionary syntax uh, is due out this June uh, 2015. And I anticipate there will be a big um, book launch and I'll get invited to party. <laughs> <laughs> they have both demonstrated their friendship uh, to the Humanities Center by their participation in its programs and its administration. Marta, for instance, uh, won a faculty fellowship competition in 1995-1996 um, and um, presented a paper on Hmong history as preserved and recreated in our oral culture, the linguistic evidence. Um, she has participated in working groups, including the social and structural implications of language and immigration. And this is her fifth Brumbach talk uh, for, the, for the center, beginning in 1997. And um, last, in 2012-13, for example, she, she gave one on the history of neg neg negation markers in Mali. Uh, Professor Povogak is also a friend of the center. Um, she has um, very recently received the prestigious Marlon Williamson Endowed Distinguished Faculty Fellowship, which she shared with Jeff Hart from Art and Art History uh, this, this, this last year. Um, and she has also um, been participating in working groups, uh, several of them, uh, one having to do with the nature of men and sententials, and also on syntax and semantics working groups. She received an innovative projects uh, award from us in 2004-2005, and she has served the distinction on our advisory board. And, um, she has given, this is now going to be her fifth Bernbach talk. So I'm very pleased, both as a colleague of these very outstanding scholars and as a director of the Humanities Center, that they have taken time out from their busy research and teaching schedules to come to talk to us today on the title, Like Father, Like Son, the Significance of Four Word, Four four word coordinated expressions across languages. Please welcome them to the podium. Well, thank you very much, Walter. Um, I do remember you being on the hiring committee and, uh, and how, what comfort that gave me. Yes. <laughs> Uh, because I think you were for me and the other linguist was not as yeah, much. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. Um, yeah, this work uh, is something we've just started. It grows out of the fact that the languages I study, the Hmong Mian languages of Southeast Asia, have certain structures that uh, are interesting for Liliana's ideas about the evolution of syntax. So that, that's sort of the nature of the intersection of our of our uh, research agendas. Um, so we're looking at uh, today these forward coordinative expressions like the English expression like father, like son. Um, like father, like son is a very symmetrical, balanced expression, but in the study of syntax there is an almost exclusive preoccupation with hierarchy and asymmetry as opposed to symmetry, such as the requirement that every phrase be headed by one of the merged elements, and that lower phrases be dominated by higher phrases on top. Um, even though some syntacticians have begun to call for the syntactic, uh, for syntactic theory to make room for symmetric structures, this is novel. This has not been traditionally the case. And Liliana will tell you more about that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so. Um, 
If you just take um, a, a simple sentence, transitive sentence like one, Maria will roll the ball. There is a lot of layering involved in the analysis of this sentence in, for example, in the syntactic theory, mainstream theory such as minimalism, Chomskyan um, theory of syntax. Um, so you will uh, start uh, the object, the ball, as, uh, oh, I have this thing so I can actually show you. <laughs> okay. So the object, the ball, will start inside the verb phrase together with the verb. Um, and then, um, so that would be one layer of structure. And then the subject, Maria, will start in another layer, which is called light VP, light verb phrase layer, uh, which is just another layer of the verb phrase, basically, uh, associated with um, causation, agenthood, etc. So um, the subjects of transitive verbs are, are thought to be originating there. Oops, oops, no. Um, and then, um, what happens next to derive the, the full finite sentence is that we also have a tense phrase. So yet another layer of structure um, which introduces tense, finiteness, nominative case and other things. But in this case, will, the marker of future tense, let's say. So, uh, so that's how we derive uh, Maria will roll the ball. Um, and this is how that looks in a tree diagram, syntactic tree diagram. So everything is layered and um, every of these phrase, uh, each of these phrases has a head. And uh, so the, the verb here, roll, is the head of the verb phrase here. This little V is the head of the light verb phrase. Um, and then the will, tense marker, is the head of tense. And then there are hierarchical relationships among these elements. So that uh, what's here is hierarchically uh, dominating the rest of the tree and can grammatically influence um, the constituents below, but not vice versa. So that's, that's the reason why we have this kind of hierarchical structure in syntax, because we found that there are asymmetrical um, relationships going on. And um, I'll show you just um, some examples of that. Uh, so, so we create several layers of structures with, with the highest layer, such in this case Maria, exerting grammatical influence over lower layers, but not vice versa. So, uh, for example, in syntax we say uh, that subjects see command objects, but not vice versa. See command, you can read it as exert influence over. Um, so, and that's why we can have uh, something like nobody insulted anybody, where anybody is a dependent item, an item that needs negation to license it. Um, and uh, the subject, negative subject, can license uh, an object that needs such licensing, but it doesn't work the other way around. So anybody insulted nobody uh, doesn't work. Uh, similarly, with the reflexive pronouns, such as herself, which are also dependent items, um, meaning that they need to have an antecedent um, to draw their reference from. Um, in, in two, in two, okay, here. Um, we have Maria, the subject, being able to exert that influence and provide the reference for herself. Maria saw herself in the mirror, but not herself saw Maria in the mirror. So there is a symmetry that um, is, that these, these sentences are truly asymmetrical. And there is a um, reason that syntacticians adopt this kind of layered structure. 
and this is just these are just the basic layers synthetics have come up with even more layers of structure but these are the basic layers that everybody agrees on um, so many synthetics uh, in fact believe that um, in order to express an assertion you actually have to have a full hierarchical sentence such as tense phrase now this has been challenged in fact by some of us here uh, Alan and um, that book one book that Walter mentioned on non-sententials and by other people but still many synthetics believe that in order to express an assertion you need to have this full hierarchical structure so, uh, uh, a tp a tense phrase or if you want to express causation um, you need to have those little grammatical words like if then or because etc etc but consider now this question um, what would a grammar without hierarchy look like can there be a grammar that is not hierarchical um, so syntheticians uh, we i am one of them um, typically relegate to the periphery uh, structures that might seem to be of that nature that do not seem to have a head for example that are not headed where it's not clear what is higher or lower um, or more important um, in the structure. Uh, so some of these um, structures are so-called exocentric compounds. Traditionally, they are described as exocentric, which, which means not headed. So this property of compounds was, was so salient that they got the name exocentric. Um, so, for example, um, scarecrow, killjoy, pickpocket. Um, the compounds that are headed, typically headed, like a bedroom, they clearly have a head. A room, a bedroom is a kind of room, so room is the head. Or um, teapot, pot is the head because a teapot is a kind of pot. But if you look at these compounds, a turncoat is not a kind of coat. Or a, or a hunchback is not a kind of back, or a pickpocket is not a kind of pocket. So they, they have been traditionally noted not to be headed. Um, and they can, in fact, be analyzed, that's how I analyze them, as just um, basic flat combinations of two words without there being hierarchy or headedness involved. Uh, although many syntheticians in fact believe that non-hierarchical structures are not possible at all and that even the compounds like these or some other structures that may seem flat in fact can be analyzed as having invisible headedness and hierarchical layering so that is the alternative view of these compounds but um, the idea here is um, if we are truly to understand how, how hierarchical grammars work, don't we need at least to give a chance to, uh, to, to, for, for the sake of comparison to see what non-hierarchical flat grammars might look like? Um, and basically uh, also try to answer the question of um, what the limits and possibilities might be of such non-hierarchical grammars um, and um, also wonder about because the hierarchical grammars we can track all those layers of structure basically by these little words grammatical words like tense markers um, that tell us that these layers are present but um, are these predictable and pervasive grammatical words also in some ways limiting what would a grammar be like if it did not necessarily have these grammatical words or hierarchical structure um, and we get to Martha at this point <laughs> yeah. well uh, we're going to turn to Mong now because Mong has numerous 
examples of these types of flat structures. And uh, we're going to be looking in particular about two of them, but I thought before getting to those two, I'd show you some that we'll not be talking about so much, but which exist in the language. Uh, the first is reduplication, which is uh, widespread in Hmong as well as all isolating or small word languages. So instead of saying very little, if you want to talk about a little path, you would, a very little path, you'd say uh, a path little little. This is very common in all of these languages, which is certainly one little doesn't take precedence over the other little. Um, there is also a whole uh, class of words that does not exist in English called expressives or idiophones, which are phonesthetic in nature. So these are not nouns or verbs or adjectives or adverbs. They're completely different. Uh, they always come in pairs. They actually can be understood as a type of reduplication themselves because they're alliterating. Uh, they have a particular morphology and are uh, very interesting uh, in terms of their semantics. Um, by the way, uh, I'll, I'll read a couple of these. You should know in looking at the spelling that the final consonants are tone markers. So the, those are not actually final consonants. So of birds flying, that would be pli and uh, of serpentine movement would be jiu jiu, which actually sounds fairly serpentine. Then in addition, another type of flat structure uh, that is famous in languages of Asia and West Africa are serial verb constructions. And Hmong also has serial noun constructions. It just likes to serialize things. So here's a sentence that means uh, Tsamua's family finished eating, but instead of uh, bundling together the notion of everyone you're related to in one noun, family, uh, it's spread out in Hmong. So you say grandfather Tsalmua group mother father son, that's Tsalmua's family, uh, and for finished eating, take rice eat done. Right. So, uh, and this is a normal way to say, uh, to say this sentence. Uh, is to decompose all of these notions and, and uh, uh, lexicalize, lex, lexicalize each aspect. Uh -huh. Will you then, can I interrupt for a question? Oh, sure, question? sure. Is that, is the, are the serial nouns there always context dependent? So uh, mm -hmm. if there were a sister, for instance, would? I think you'd put her in there too. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, there, there's a word for household, but there isn't a word for family yeah. per se. Okay. I was just wondering how, yeah. how contextually driven the serialization is. Well, it no, this is not uh, this is not like a lexicalized string. You can change the parts of it uh, freely. Okay. Um, in addition to those three structures, there are also uh, two word compounds of the non-headed sort. Uh, completely symmetrical compounds that are either synonyms or complements. So uh, tunsai is the way you say children, and that's son, daughter, taken together, right? Uh, there is no single morpheme that means children in Hmong, right? You would either use tunsai, son, daughter, or uh, tuki, which means son, children. You, but there's no simple way to say children in one word. Um, and there are also, uh, and this is what we're going to be focusing on, these forward coordinative compounds of the A, B, A, C type, where the first and third word are the same, and the second and the fourth words are <coughs> either members of a two-word compound or other words that are connected semantically, either as synonyms or as complements in some sense. So to earn a living, uh, to earn a living, uh, and this is a lexicalized forward uh, coordinative compound, is wanawaha, to make eat, make drink. That's how you earn a living. There are a lot of the uh, children type compound, the son daughter type compound. The, there's actually a name for these, uh, divandva or twin compounds. This is a term that comes from Sanskrit, where they are also quite common. Uh, they are not particularly common in English. In fact, I don't know if I can come up with one in English. Maybe some of you can. But this is, uh, again, where there is no head, but the two parts of the compound have equal status. 
So for home, you say garden house, vache is home. For farm, you say liate, which is paddy field, dry field, in combination. For crops, you say bonglong, which is crops, crops, produce, crops, together. Country, daejeon, is land, place. Uh, weather is huajua, which is cloud wind, taken together. Uh, clothes, here it's, they're obviously complementary. Jicho, uh, pants, jacket. Um, there, there are no single words for any of the things in the right-hand column. They don't exist. Uh, there is no word for weapon. You would say jiapo, knife, gun. Right? Uh, face is a wonderful one. So there is no word for face. You would say jemu, which is ear, eye. So everything from your ear to your eye is your face. And then I, I love the last one too. There are lizards all over the place in Southeast Asia, but there, there is no word for lizard in Hmong. It's napa, which is snake frog. It's half snake and half frog. <laughs> um, so if you want to be more expressive in the Hmong, this is an, this is an oral culture where uh, orality is highly prized. So. If you want to elaborate on one of these compounds, it's easy to do by simply inserting it into the A, A frame. Uh, so, I hmm, don't know what happened there, but if you want to say to have a home and garden house together means a home, you'd say mua va mua che, as have garden, have house is to have a home. And if you want to make it even more elegant, you would double that and uh, add another forward coordinative construction that would expand the notion. Uh, is to have garden, have house, have wet field, have dry field. That means to own property. And these are not unusual. These are kind of normal in this language. Um, so. Here are some expanded uh, Devandava compounds uh, using the ABAC structure. So um, here's taking Jemua, which is face, putting it um, into the BC slots with the verb Ti, which means remember. Uh, remember ear, remember eye is to remember someone, is to remember their face, like I know your face. Uh, is jia is an interesting word that means any ridge-like part of your body, like your nose ridge or your shoulders. So ridge branch and branch is also used for leg. Together means ancestry or lineage. So one's ancestry could be expressed in an A B A C construction. Yu jia yu qi. I actually need to get together with a native speaker because sometimes the meanings of these. Um, forward coordinative constructions are subtle and uh, not entirely obvious. So uh, taking a cloud, cloud wind together and putting it after a word that means word, word cloud, word wind, I think that probably means stormy words or fighting words. Uh, uh, knife gun, uh, under, un, in danger, I, I suspect, is what this one means, under the knife and under the gun. But this ABAC structure is not simply a means of expanding one of these Devandva compounds. You can put any pair of related words into the BC slot and get one of these forward constructions. So uh, this first one, fruit, vine, fruit, tree, root, vine, root, tree, was used of someone describing when they had to live in the jungle and couldn't raise their own food and had to uh, eat whatever they could pluck off, off the trees and uh, pull from the ground. Um, uh, tooth, knife, tooth, sword, uh, sharp toothed, which I think is probably used to describe someone vicious, uh, border water, border earth, perhaps to the ends of the earth. Again, I need to check all of these with uh, a speaker, my, the consultant I've 
been working with has moved away to Minneapolis, which was a great loss to me, but I'll, I'll find someone to take her place. And then this wonderful one at the end, uh, finish liver, finish lung, finish stomach, finish heart, right? I'm done. Right? <laughs> That's all I've got, <laughs> which is a really nice one. The types of words that show up in the A position, they can be uh, various kinds of words. Uh, they can be verbs. Uh, wa'u wa'na is very, very common for word construction. Do this, do that. Right? Uh, also, the verb to have is a common uh, carrier of the BC pair. Uh, have liver, have lungs. Um, you can have classifiers that, in, in, under indefinite animate terms, uh, do and they are both classifiers. So referring to a person who wins or loses, you know, person win, person lose, people leader, people chief, those in power. Uh, reciprocals are often used in this position too. Shikya, uh, shikye, each other fight, each other curse. Or negatives, chita, chika. Not finished, not done. Also very common. I'll tell you what those numbers are in the final column in a minute. Uh, in working on this uh, presentation, I asked David Mortensen, who recently did a study of these um, forward coordinative constructions in Hong, if he might share his database with me, and he was kind enough to do so. He constructed a database of just these A, B, A, C compounds from a website, uh, a Hmong uh, Usenet uh, group website, where English and Hmong are mixed liberally. It's not just all in Hmong. And uh, he designed a program that would extract just these A, B, A, C compounds. And he came up with 16,000, right? Uh, 16,106 tokens of 3,253 distinct ABAC compounds. And the numbers that I had back here show how many times, for example, U, Ua, which means do, uh, showed up in, uh, as the carrier of one of, uh, of one of these compounds. So nine, in, in the, there were 1,901 tokens, and the verb to have showed up in 994, so they're very common. And they sort of go down in frequency from there. Um, so uh, this corpus, again, uh, was a, a web corpus. Uh, I just did a screenshot of what it looks like. You have to actually be a member and log on, so I just I couldn't kind of link to it. So this is just a screenshot. If I don't know if you can see, but you'll see English and Hmong mixed liberally in the headings for the topics that are being discussed. Some are all in English, some are all in Hmong, some are interestingly uh, a mix of Hmong and English, like the fourth one down that says, uh, 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 you might enjoy uh, three Hmong videos on uh, wild, uh, might you enjoy, excuse me, might you enjoy three Hmong videos on uh, how to kill, kill wild animals in the jungle? <laughs> That's what the fourth one down says. Uh, you know, but clearly the people who interact with each other on this website know English. Um, so, based on the fact that you know, 16,000 of these things was pulled from this uh, website, it's clear that this is not an archaic type of expression. Young people use these expressions. Young internet savvy people use these expressions. Young people who know English use these expressions. So this is an, a robust type of construction in the language. It's not at all poetic or old fashioned. However, the more formal the language and the more skilled the orator, the more of these constructions you will hear. Hmm. Like I've gone to Hmong um, church services where even though I can't, it's going by too fast and I can't follow it well, you will hear the repeated words over and over and over. It's sort of like, it's almost like you think of a call and response uh, preaching 
you just hear the, the rhythm and the structure, and it, and it hinges on these repeated words. So, and I, people tell me that that, that makes for a, a good preacher if they can do that. Um, so here's an example of more formal language and an example of how, how these things are exploited in a more um, uh, uh, extended piece of uh, discourse. So this is from a wedding ceremony, and the translation of it is, I'm calling the son and daughter-in-law into the house. The husband shall come and come with the wife. The wife shall come and come with the children. The children shall come and come with the spirits of prosperity, abundance, love, and power, son and daughter-in-law. Right. So this is what you say at the, at the door of the house that will be the house of the bride and groom. And I've put within square brackets uh, the coordinative constructions. So. Uh, Tunya is a son, daughter-in-law, which shows up at the t first line, and then at the bottom, me, me tumenya, that in a four-word construction, that means little son, little daughter-in-law. It just means dear son, dear daughter-in-law. Right? Then in the second line, tu uh, bring or lead uh, son, lead child, lead children, in other words. Uh, Duki is one of these Dvandva compounds that means children. Uh, P-L-I-G is the word for um, spirit, right? Uh, so in the third line, right here, Pli Nya that means spirit of money, spirit of gold, spirit of crops, spirit of produce. Uh, the way of the leader, the way of the boss. Um, I'm sorry, that's that one. This is the, uh, the way of the house, the way of the home, the way of uh, the leader, the way of the boss. Uh, dear son, dear daughter-in-law, right? But it's even more symmetrical than that. There are verb phrases that repeat, you know, bring, you bring, he brings you, you bring them. So there's much more symmetry in here than just that. Um, this is a quote from um, a book by Yves Bertré, who was a uh, Catholic priest who lived with a monk almost his whole adult life and was a fluent speaker of the language and also one of the devisers of the writing system for the language. And uh, he really had a good feel for the genius of this language. He wrote, uh, the words are associated so as to make up a multitude of constructions of a binary rhythm. For the binary rhythm is to be found in the use of the strophe and the antistrophe, in the imagery, in the characters which normally are two, the utensils which will be two, the actions for which a parallel will always be found, etc. If therefore the singer speaks of the enclosure, luva, it will be expected that at once, or just a little farther on, he will give a parallel expression involving the house, luce. If one character does something with his right hand, you can expect to have a parallel expression saying what his left hand does. Now, we don't have anything, you know, near as uh, rich as, as that in English, but we do have some nice flat symmetrical expressions. They have become, uh, they have become uh, frozen, uh, lexicalized to a certain extent. Uh, we don't come up with new ones easily, but they're uh, known widely. They're part of the language, nothing ventured, nothing gained. Card laid, card played, easy come, easy go. First come, first serve. Monkey see, monkey do. Come on, come all, like father, like son. Etc. Um, there are ones like that in Bung, um, and these uh, again are not productive. People pass them down. They are learned. Uh, crops late, crops chaff. Boy late, boy orphan. In other words, don't be late. Bad things will happen. Uh, see tiger get dead. See politician get poor. These rhyme, <laughs> right? So. Tigers are dangerous, and so are politicians. They're bad consequences. Um, cow fat you raise, cow skinny you stab. So you're going to spend more time on something that really uh, might pay off for you. And 
for the others, you, you just get, get rid of them as fast as you can. So, but there are more, so, uh, yeah, yeah, there is more. <laughs> so, other languages, it, it looks like all languages have some of that A, B, A, C pattern, usually kind of proverbs, sayings, um, so Latin has some, definitely. Notice that in Latin, um, we either have the A, A, B, A, B, A, C, um, but also a, a sort of variation of A, uh, a correlative sort of uh, structure, which is also a kind of A, B, A, C pattern, but with a little twist. So now there is a correlative thing. Um, and uh, similar, okay, and th this is an example from Tui, um, which uh, uh, the data, I collected the data when I was actually in Martha's uh, field methods class um, in 2011. So something like you sow, you reap, uh, you seek, you find. It's so basic that it looks like we don't need to know this language, we can just uh, know the words and we know exactly what is meant. So it's it's some kind of a deep um, uh, understanding of these structures. Um, but uh, you can express deep wisdom uh, with structures like this, um, which again, uh, seem to be just flat, without grammatical words, without hierarchy. Um, Serbian also has a lot of examples with this um, ABAC pattern with a twist, uh, where you have correlative words, um, so across shorter, around closer, preko preče, now kolo bliže, also kind of um, rhyming. Um, so, what on mind, that on road, long hair, sh short intelligence. Uh, <laughs> a, 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 how much money, that much music. Um, and then, what kind father, that kind son. Kakav otac, takav sin. So again, uh, the pattern is there, but with a little twist, with a little change, tweaking the A uh, um, pattern. So uh, th there is also um, reportedly um, in emerging sign languages, um, one example would be Nicaraguan sign language. At its earliest stages, it has been reported that these grammars also tend to be flattened to some extent, where they seem to resemble these kinds of four for coordinative, for word coordinative structures. So in this earliest stage, it is not really attested or possible to say woman push man as a transitive sentence, which, which necessarily would have to have the layering and the structure. What, what happens instead is that this is kind of flattened into two plus two, into something like woman push men react, woman push men fall, a very similar kind of symmetric uh, structure, A, B, A, C with a twist, if you want. And actually a similar phenomenon, so it's not just a, a quirk of uh, Nicaraguan sign language, but has been noted in other emerging sign languages, um, su such as Al Said Badwin sign language, so similar patterns uh, emerge there too. What is really interesting is that um, these are kind of symmetrical binary unions and uh, and typically we do not find ternary on, or more, uh, more, more of these kind of piled up. Um, and uh, so the exception is uh, no shoes, no shirt, no service. That's an exception, not a rule. The rule really is to have two by two. That seems to be what our brains can handle, can process. But not, if you have something like two, what does this really mean? Nothing ventured, nothing gained, nothing lost. We, we don't really know. We can, um, uh, try to guess, we can pair things up, uh, but our brains seem to refuse even to 
assign meaning to this. And it's, it's not that this is just ambiguous. It's different from just ambiguous structures, such, such as uh, when we say the man saw the woman with the binoculars. This is ambiguous. It could be the man uh, saw with the binoculars or the woman held the binoculars. So linguists often talk about these ambiguities and they, they are very frequent in languages. But when we have such an ambiguous structure, we typically hear it and we reach for only one interpretation immediately. And we usually don't notice the other one at all. Or we might notice it. But we, we do reach for an interpretation right away. We are not at a loss. We don't say, oh boy, what, what does this now mean? It can mean more than one thing. But with these kinds of structures, nothing ventured, nothing gained, gained, nothing lost. I think we are at a loss as to what this is even supposed to mean. And that's because they are not, um, the argument is that they are not structured in a layered way, which gives us exactly the guidelines as to how to interpret things. If we were to add grammatical words, if nothing is ventured and nothing is gained, then nothing is lost either. That would solve our problem. Uh, it, it would give us a very precise uh, interpretation. But without, without these little words, um, our brains are seem capable of pairing just two things at a time and giving, uh, imposing an interpretation which is sort of iconic in the sense of causation or precedence. So whatever comes first is what causes the, the next. So when we say nothing ventured, nothing gained, it really means if the, the cause is first and the consequence is second, we cannot flip them around. We cannot say nothing gained, nothing ventured. That, if you do say it, it means something totally different. So, anyways, um, it seems that our brains are okay with processing these flat structures as long as they come in pairs. But if not, then we are sort of at a loss. Um, I mentioned those compounds, um, the uh, verb noun compounds, which are called exocentric. Now what is interesting about these compounds um, that many people who actually worked on them found them intriguing because uh, even though the structure is so simple, there is no grammatical, word, uh, grammatical uh, morphemes in them, uh, they are, people have, have uh, been so creative with them that they created thousands of these compounds. It's not clear why anybody would need to have thousands of these compounds, but that's been the reporting. Um, that, uh, and and uh, people who worked on them, like for Serbian, Mihailovic says that they pack in them not only sentences, but also frozen fairy tales, proverbs, ancient wisdoms, and metaphors. And uh, similar claims have been made for English but by, for example, Weekly, uh, who claimed that in the medieval times there were thousands of these compounds. You would wonder why you needed that huge number of compounds. Uh, for French, Dermestater was also so impressed that he said the artistic beauty and richness of these compounds is inexhaustible and uh, may attain Homeric breath, if poets would use them again. So it's very interesting that it seems that with this simple syntactic structure, you can get very creative in combining. Um, usually the combinations are uh, very concrete, concrete images, but when you combine two concrete images, you get a very interesting new abstract uh, uh, concept. So, um, so you can get quite creative. It's, it's really interesting how many you can create um, by being um, innovative with these. And, 
I think okay. we are back to Martha. Yeah, we'll just briefly to conclude. To conclude. Uh, conclusions, okay. Then both symmetrical and asymmetrical structures are found in present day human languages. But see Liliana's <laughs> forthcoming book for the role specifically of the symmetrical structures uh, for early stages in, of language evolution. Uh, and do see her book. And, you know. <laughs> um, in isolating languages in particular, and again, these are the languages of uh, East and Southeast Asia and West Africa in particular, perhaps also Creole languages uh, that may, might fit this mold. Uh, symmetrical, non-hierarchical structures are not at all peripheral, right? but play an important role in language and thus me, must be accounted for in, in any theory of syntax. And I think we would prefer not to account for them by building invisible hierarchies over them. Um, they are remarkably expressive in that the relationships between words are not specific, uh, not specified with exactness. The hearer must participate in the process of meaning creation. So when I was not able to check with my Hmong consultant, I had to kind of guess at the meaning of some of those forward coordinative constructions. I, I couldn't be sure without context and without a native speaker at hand. Um, here are some of our references, and with that, we will just stop and ask if there are <laughs> any questions. <laughs>
or I I understand that nothing ventured, nothing gained. I don't I don't think they actually that that sounds good to you. I think Well in the first one there was enough prosody so that you you know you get away with it but and yeah. and the second I think uh, well surely you can do it with prosody but I'm not sure about a direct object. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. But, but, but yeah. that's an interesting point. Yes, you can in mom. You can you can do that. In fact, that little thing from the wedding ceremony mm -hmm. had forward expressions as objects. Okay. There was like uh, like bring uh, uh, small child, small child, where the two words for child okay. were different. So, but it was the object of bring. So. And they're, so they're more productive in mom. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. That would be interesting to see across languages with those piano music. Yeah. So it looks, it looks like some languages just um, just make them very important and productive and, and um, uh, use them yeah. much more. Than I was thinking of one, uh, don't know, don't care, where it should be, you know, it's, yeah. it's, it's longer, right? But you have to like cut off the subject, you have to make it don't and do not make it that happen. Yeah, it does, it does. Even also in English, um, the more the merrier is also of that kind. Mm -hmm. And even, and then they can become more elaborate in English, like the more you do something, the more you, I mean, they can become, they're still correlative at the beginnings, but then you can embed a lot <coughs> down in them. So some kind of continuity. <laughs> well, if, if you want a, a celebrated example, you could take Bob Marley's No Woman, No Cry. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, that's, that's a good one. That's, that's a good I one. I can yeah. sing it for you. <laughs> <laughs> and um, in the Creole, so you get, you get things like mouth open, story out. Mouth open, story out. Mouth open story out. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah, that's what we're There's got to be some, some idiom, idiomatic. Because, for example, we were listening to uh, a paper presented by one of my students uh, uh, who, who did Creole as well. And um, she wanted to illustrate illustrate um, some Creole from Bob Marley. And she played a song, um, No Woman, No Cry. Mm -hmm. And I understood it immediately. Mm -hmm. but, but her colleagues couldn't. Mm -hmm. so, so I think there is, there, 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 there's got to be a cultural way of interpreting these expressions. Probably. Because they're not totally obvious. Professor Edwards, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Just before we get off topic, what you brought up, does that mean that if you don't have a woman, you don't cry? That's right. No woman, no cry. <laughs> <laughs> you go ahead and, and uh, if you want worries, you take a woman. <laughs> well, isn't there isn't there an expression in our language like no no wife, no problems, or no something like that? Happy wife, happy life. <laughs> she must be here. Happy wife, happy life. Oh, there, there is another one. Yeah. Um, I don't have the vocabulary for it, but I don't understand how what Martha was talking about and putting what like, we're substitute for family mm -hmm. with the, the, the chain of, of, of nouns mm -hmm. that would be a part of it. How that is the same kind of structure as nothing ventured, nothing gained. The latter sounds to me like a grammatical ellipsis. If you don't venture anything, you won't gain anything. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, how, are these, how are these talked about in the same framework, mm -hmm. these two phenomena? Because, OK, yes, yeah. no, that's a great question. Um, when we have mother, child, mother, no, son, da daughters, mother, mother, father, meaning parents. Mm -hmm. That actually occurs in other languages as well, Mayan, for example. Uh, that is symmetrical. Yeah. That's where they are similar, and it's binary. So you have two elements symmetrically merging. None of them is the head, 
none of them is, is the more important element, so to speak. They merge in a binary fashion. Now, what we find in A, B, A, C is that we have two of these, <laughs> or syntactically speaking, purely structurally speaking. So we have, again, a merge of two without the head and another two without the head, and then those two are brought together. And then some of Martha's examples show that you can even bring more of these. Now you create four, now you can bring another four. Right. How is that the same as the it's nothing ventured, nothing gained type of structure? Mm -hmm. it's because in nothing ventured, you again have two words merging. For you, this seems like, okay, take easy come, easy go. Maybe that will be easier to imagine, or first come, first serve. Not first come, first served. Both of them occur. But but we also find first come, first serve. I've searched that. Really? Yes, yes. People actually um, uh, ask, why don't you have first come, first served? And that does occur too. And that's our impulse to sort of make it more in line with the, with the more elaborate hierarchical grammars. But in fact, first come, first serve is as, just as common, which means we have these two words which merge together, first come, and are not really creating any syntactic unit that we understand what it would be. So they're not creating a phrase, and they're not uh, using the grammatical pieces. And then we have another one just like that, first serve, um, which again are a merger of two and not creating a grammatical unit which is headed and missing all the pieces of morphology or grammatical structure and then they are put together so that again there is no marker of what accounts for the meaning relationship between them but we impose iconically the meaning of, of, on them which would be causal or precedence meaning. Let me give you an example mm -hmm. of what I know. Uh, there's, a, there's a phrase that I came across that echoes something that was said. John Donne, the poet, married, eloped with the woman he married, and it was a disaster, disaster for his career. He lost his job mm -hmm. and took a long while to recover. Mm -hmm. And uh, Somebody wrote down John Dunn, Anne Dunn, Undone in London. Now, uh, if, if you had just John Dunn, Undone, mm -hmm. would that be like the structures you're talking about? Well, uh, it, it wouldn't be the four word co coordinate, no, no. but it does. Yeah, what's actually Alan and, and the, the book that we co edited talks about is these non-sentential grammars, the grammars that are possible, that do not have all the syntactic structure and layering. So, so John Dunn, we would analyze as a smaller structure than John ha was done or will be done. Uh, so, and Andan also, our, our uh, point is that you can have even a single word um, have meaning. We can interpret it even if it's not embedded um, into a full sentential structure, uh, which was something I, we talked about uh, initially about making an assertion. So if you say done, well, Alan and I and some other people would believe that that's, that's an assertion. Um, uh, but uh, according to some syntheticians like Jason Merchant and others, the argument would be that in order for this to be uh, an assertion, you have to build the complete structure and then to tear it down, so that this would be ellipsis, basically. But our argument was that, no, you don't need to construct the whole sentence and then tear it down. You can use uh, just single words or phrases or non-sententials um, to express the meaning um, uh, together with the context that you can find, and we have some arguments for it. Yes. Thank you for your talk.
I, uh, I want to ask about the exocentric compounds. Mm -hmm. Professor Ratcliffe, I remember from your previous talk on the Hmong language that there was really no written form until the 50s, right? Yeah. Okay. And, and Professor Progovic, is it? Progovic, is it? Progovitz. Progovitz. You gave up a lot of, you gave a lot in a lot of languages. Mm -hmm. A lot of examples. Mm -hmm. I noticed that when you gave your examples, they were all hyphenated. Uh, yeah. Huh? Yeah. They, they are not. Some, not of those, some of those words that become like compound words on their own, right? The, like yeah. The, pocket the, can be written as one word. It, it, yeah. No, the reason I hyphenate them is only to make it very obvious that they consist of two pieces because very often actually native speakers do not perceive them as having two pieces. Sure. Well, they started as hyphenations that kind of lost the hyphenation. I don't know what that process is, but we decide. Uh, That's just the writing the system, which is, we, we, we think it's being a, a kind of a, not the language itself. So right. there, there are plenty of compounds in English that we don't hyphenate or write together, but they're still compounds. Like, there are, but there are, just like tomorrow used to be hyphenated when it was originally started. Yeah. So the hyphenation is like a, um, an initial step to put things together to a group name. And I, I was wondering, is there a name for that? That, that the first step, like initially, like starting to start something together? These, like in the, in the way that you're saying language was built by these, these mm -hmm. two words, these mm -hmm. components being put together. It could be, yeah. I, I don't know. I don't know if ever there was a hyphen. I'm, I'm thinking about Serbian uh, compounds, um, whether people ever used uh, hyphens. I don't know. And why did they choose the hyphen? Uh, in, it, it seems that uh, mm -hmm. in all these languages, why was that symbol decided as the starting point to join things together? Yeah, it's uh, probably arbitrary. Yeah. Sort of. Yeah. That would be another field of study, I think. Yeah. Now the term is lexicalization. When you get afraid, you know, when you say two words together, often enough it just becomes a single entity, and that's called it's become a thing. It's become a word, a lexical item. That's called lexicalization. Yeah. I have a question about the difference between endocentric and exocentric compounds. Yeah. So if endocentric compounds have a general structure. Um, but they, they seem to be very productive and even very unsure that they really make them. And the relationship, the semantic relationship between the two elements is very free. So, for example, a frogman could be made who likes dogs, who eats frogs, etc. Right? Mm -hmm. So, and little children, if you, if experiments have been done, so they're, they're able to, to tell them, what do you call a book that is um, kind of shaped with star and that's a mm -hmm. star book? So the relationship is kind of, it's very broad, mm -hmm. but it can be, a, and it's very productive, mm -hmm. but it has a hierarchical structure. Mm -hmm. So intuitively, it would seem that it should be that way around, mm -hmm. and um, the, um, having a structure should kind of constrain the, uh, the possible relationship and make it maybe a little, I, I don't know, less productive, mm -hmm. but in, in, in the case of existential compounds, they seem to be, it's hard to make one. Yes, they're they unproductive. Meaning that you cannot change. Yeah, they're unproductive in English and Serbian. The only uh, languages where they are productive are some Romance languages, which is interesting, where people have argued, like Ferrari, I have it somewhere back there, that they do have hierarchical structure in Italian, for example. Um, but um, yeah, the the noun noun compounds in English are very interesting. I haven't really looked at them or tried to analyze them. But what I compared uh, those verb noun compounds to are the um, equivalent verb noun compounds with the ER ending. And I have, so, so um, 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 uh, kill joy versus joy killer. So, so the argument is that even though th they are similar, um, they can express similar concepts. 
uh, joy killer is clearly more complex and it has one piece of structure extra and in English they can be more um, they, they can be actually uh, recursive like um, window cleaner uh, I don't know how can we make a recurse truck driver chaser somebody who chases truck drivers right so so um, it looks like that if you have more structure you can do more things with those compounds but again I haven't the reason I don't quite understand I don't want to make any statement of, about English now noun, noun compounds is, is because in Serbian they are not productive I don't know how it is in Russian but in, in Serbian I, I cannot they almost don't exist they exist as borrowings but I cannot create like um, something like armchair or a coffee table it has to be table for coffee or bedroom doesn't exist it has to be a sleeping room these across languages actually differ some people see it's a parameter yeah. yes probably some kind of parameter but but that's that's why i yeah, yeah I, I actually don't know what happens exactly with the noun noun compounds in English. I think they are, they are interesting because they are productive, they are recursive, you can, but that doesn't happen in, in other languages. I mean, that productivity and ability to even make them is, is interesting. But uh, so, so I have no <laughs> analysis actually. And that's my reasoning, uh, why I did not come up with the analysis of English noun noun compounds, um, because they're not they they look simple on, on the surface of it because you can just combine them and recombine them, and it looks like this is something you can just do in every language. But then you find languages which cannot do that. So so it's an interesting question of what, what is going on there. So that's why I only compared um, so, uh, something like killjoy with joy killer. And then what also emerges in language acquisition, and there are a couple of papers on that, um, uh, the acquisition of compounds such as joy killer uh, is that children actually start with killjoy. So even if you um, present them with, uh, so, so they, are, they are asked, okay they are prompted to um, create new novel compounds and they would be you know given something uh, he's a brush eater or something prompted to say say that and uh, according to these papers hacked one author is hacked i i can i can uh, show you those papers uh, that children first start saying things like eat brush and then eater brush start playing uh, not not able to to uh, immediately say brush either it comes later with age which is interesting so, which seemingly supports the idea that these are more that they are hierarchical and more complex to acquire 